Hello and welcome to part two of this course where we go into machine learning. So this section will be primarily focused on introducing the topic of machine learning, some of the difficulties, some of the approaches, the different methods, different applications, etc. And we'll start applying some of this in the following sections. So everything up until now can be categorized as just data science, general data science, that actually consists of probably 80%, 90% of a data scientist's job. So contrary to popular belief, right, as a data scientist, you won't be spending too much time doing machine learning, a lot of your time will be spent acquiring data, building systems and pipelines, and processes for, you know, the acquisition of data, it's cleaning up, it's storage, you know, it's maintenance and all of that. So a lot of time will be spent on those details and everything we've learned up to now will help you with that. And let me also add to that, you know, reporting, building systems for presenting your work or giving access to it. You know, this could be in the form of an API or a shiny app or an R markdown report or whatever it may be. So a lot of time is spent up, you know, in the steps up to, you know, an actual machine learning task and following it, right? So, you know, the building the system, the pipelines, cleaning the data, acquiring it, all of that is before you get a chance to apply any machine learning to a project. And then once you actually do apply machine learning and you do get your results, there are a lot of steps that follow that as well, right? You need to make your results accessible. You know, you need to make it applicable, right? You can come up with a, with a very nice, you know, model. But if your client or your company can't actually use this in production or use this live, right, as new data comes in, or they can't use it to make decisions, they're not easily able to access that model, or to run it, or to use it, then, you know, there's really no point in everything you did. So there are a lot of steps following and preceding machine learning itself, that will take up most of your time as data scientists, unless, you know, you do find that odd job, you know, here and there, and maybe at some bigger companies, where they have other people to take care of those steps. And you know, you're just hired as like a machine learning engineer, or something, and you just focus your time on applying the raw machine learning to a data set, you know, that's already been cleaned and, and all of that by some, you know, another team. But nowadays, we're seeing a transition into one man, single man parades, if you will, like, where companies are expecting a single, you know, individual to be able to do most of this work. And that's not that's something that's actually it's not an exaggerated expectation. It's very plausible. It's very, in my opinion, very normal to expect that from a data scientist. And the reason for that is because machine learning has gotten so much easier to implement by the average layman. See, before machine learning could only be implemented by people who had very high level knowledge in mathematics and statistics. And they knew the topic, you know, academically very well. So, you know, they would most probably have to be like PhD educated individuals, you know, with a background in, in mathematics or statistics or something like that, or, or at least computer science. And so you couldn't expect of someone like that to also know how to deal with the more routine data acquisition, cleaning up, you know, storage databases, and, and that kind of stuff. So you would have a team that would deal with that. And then you would have your machine learning specialist building the actual models and, and that kind of stuff. But nowadays, machine learning has developed to the point where, you know, you don't really need to have that much knowledge. Uh, you still need to know some, you, know, you need to have some basic understanding of statistics so you can interpret your results. But in terms of applying machine learning algorithms and models and training them, there are a lot of amazing libraries out there, like the library we're going to be using here, the tidy models set of packages, or in Python, you have scikit-learn, etc, that really make that stuff easy for you. So you can actually focus on developing your skills across the stack. So and companies are also starting, starting to realize that it's not very sustainable to employ a whole team of data scientists. So a lot of companies are starting to actually outsource all their data science work to contractors or external consultants. So, you know, that's a potential career for you, right, to be a consultant, or you, know, you can call yourself a data professional or a data strategy consultant or something of that sort. 
And so you would be expected to at least be familiar enough with the stack to where you could, if needed, outsource some of that work. But from the company's perspective, the company that's hiring you, you're the one that's doing the whole project from beginning to end. And in those rare situations where you really do need to have a machine learning expert, you can outsource that work as well. You know, there are a lot of professors out there, you know, experts in machine learning, you know, you, they have hourly rates. You consult them on very fine details concerning certain machine learning algorithms when needed to. But again, that nowadays plays quite a small role in an actual data science project because, you know, nowadays dealing with that big data, being able to like maintain it and to build you know, data lakes, data mart, data bases and that kind of stuff. And all of that, that also transitions kind of into DevOps. But DevOps itself has also been seeing a transition where now we have like, you know, machine learning ops, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into so too many details, but I just want to give you the impression that it does make sense nowadays for data science scientists to be familiar with the whole pipeline, the whole range of tools required to get a data set prepared before you can even do machine learning on it and everything following it as well. So again, you know, you don't need to worry too much about that. Just focus on mastering this course. If you really understand and master everything in this course, you will have that complete, you know, full stack of tools to become a very proficient modern data scientist. So you don't have to worry about that too much. I just want to open your eyes a little bit to what's going on currently in the data world. So with that, let's get started with understanding what machine learning actually is. So I took this definition off of Wikipedia just to keep it consistent. There are a lot of different definitions of machine learning and they might slightly change based on how long ago that particular article or, or whatever journal entry or whatever was written. written. Uh, but essentially machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve through experience. And this experience is fed back into the algorithm as data. So essentially, you know, data is collected and the machine learning algorithm is enhanced or improved or changed based on, on that experience, which in turn um, should result in a more improved performance and so on and so forth. And, and when you can automate this, uh, where this happens automatically, that's, you know, essentially what machine learning is. Um, and it is a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a very large domain, a very large field. Machine learning is a specific part of that domain. And, you know, there's a lot of misconception when it comes to the word artificial intelligence. But, you know, that's why we're not going to define machine learning or artificial intelligence as being machine learning. But machine learning is generally accepted to be under the umbrella of AI. And basically how machine learning works is that a machine learning algorithm builds a mathematical model based on sample data. And that sample data is called the training data set or training data, keep it simple. And the aim is for the algorithm or the program written on, you know, based on that algorithm to start being able to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. So sort of being able to learn from that data and pull in patterns or certain understandings from that data that will allow it to make decisions that it wasn't explicitly programmed to do, right? And we're going to see a lot of examples of this in the future slides as well. Um, this is kind of more of a theoretical definition. And when you use machine learning and you know, apply it to business problems, it's generally known as predictive analytics. And this is actually something that's, you know, been around for some time. Machine learning nowadays is a very flashy term to be throwing around, but the underlying principles in machine learning and a lot of core machine learning work that's done today is actually quite old. Before it was referred to as statistical learning because Machine learning is essentially statistical methods for solving certain problems. And we're not going to get into too much of that theory in this course, but, you know, machine learning is, is a modern term for statistical learning or predictive analytics, essentially, okay? And we can differentiate between statistical learning, and, you know, machine learning and you know, deep learning. Deep learning is, is a whole nother field, and that's something that is pretty new in the sense that we haven't been able to use deep learning to really solve problems uh, similar to the problems we're solving now previously. But we were able to do, do that using machine learning, but we didn't have as much data to work with. 
So previously, like statistical learning was used on smaller data sets, you know, simple problems, even problems that, you know, you could, you know, essentially solve, you know, by hand, you know, by seeing the data set yourself and, and, and running some equations and, and coming to conclusions and, and that kind of stuff. But nowadays, uh, we're able to apply machine learning to large data sets, data sets far larger than any you'd be able to, to fathom or understand by just looking at the data. Now, machine learning, I'm using ML to refer to it instead of writing out machine learning every time, but it has a very wide variety of applications, very wide, like too many applications to even list here. So I just listed a few here. So email filtering, computer vision, loan prediction, sales forecasting. So they seem to be very different domains, uh, right? Email filtering is very different from computer vision, which is very different from loan prediction, which is completely different from sales forecasting, right? But what they all have in common is they're using machine learning principles and the concept of developing conventional algorithms to perform certain needed tasks, but doing so in a way where you don't explicitly program it to perform a certain task, but it's able to learn from data. Now, why machine learning? That This is an important question uh, that many people ask. Uh, why, you know, if you are a good programmer and you can leverage that and you can write, you know, programs and you can automate a lot of tasks, why do you need to use machine learning and how do you know when to use machine learning? So there are a lot of problems that computer scientists have encountered throughout the years and a lot of problems that are very difficult to solve from using conventional programming methods. So it's there are certain problems that are very hard to write programs for to solve. And, you know, an example would be facial recognition. So if you were to apply a conventional method um, in order to write a program to perform facial recognition, it would be extremely, extremely difficult. And there are a lot of problems like this that pop up that have long been known to be extremely difficult, you know, facial recognition, recognizing handwritten digits, and, and so on and so forth. And the reason some of these problems are difficult is because, you know, initially they seem like it, you know, they should be solvable because they're tasks that are so easy for us to perform as humans. And, but when you really, you know, think about it, we don't really know how our brain performs these tasks. And the thing is, these tasks are so complicated that even if we did know how our brains perform them, we would, you know, really struggle writing a program to mimic that. And, and even if we could, the programs would be extremely complicated. So instead of writing a program by hand, you know, which is what conventional programming does, we can instead collect a lot of examples that specify the correct output for a given input, okay? So in the case of facial recognition, we can collect millions of examples of data of images and we can classify them, you know, we can specify that which image or which digit is the correct one based on our own human input. And we can take that data and feed it into a machine learning algorithm and the machine learning algorithm can learn from that data how to classify new cases. Okay, that's essentially what machine learning is. And the point of machine learning algorithm is that you do have to have a lot of initial data that you yourself have classified so the program knows which are which. But the point is to get the algorithm to a level from which it can actually recognize new images. So this tends to require a lot of data. But, you know, in the end, you, you are able to predict new cases. That's basically the gist of machine learning. And so some of the requirements for machine learning to work or to be able to implement machine learning is that there must be some pattern between the input and output of the data. So let's take the example of handwritten digits. So imagine you have a bunch of handwritten digits from a bunch of different people. You had people write down the letters like uh, the number zero to nine and you, you collected tens of thousands of these and you scanned them and then you like oriented them and you labeled each of them. So when there's a six, right? You yourself have typed in six there. So any program, any model that's being fed this data will know automatically what digit each image is, okay? Because you've labeled them yourself. Now, there is a pattern between this image and your label of it because everybody writing that digit knows that writing that digit. So for example, the number six, everybody writing number six, their hand generally moves in, you know, some motion that results in six. So there might be some differences in the way people are writing the, the number six, but in general, they're all using some of the same actions. 
Um, so there is a pattern. Let's take another example. For example, if you want to predict loans and as an input you take in many cases of people or you take in data for of people you know their past loans how much they've loaned before how long it's taken them to pay how long it takes them you know how late they are paying the normal bills how often they do they use a credit card and that kind of stuff okay and you take those kind of inputs and you're trying to predict which of them will fail to pay back their loans or succeed in paying back their loans what you're basically doing is trying to find a pattern between actions of people and whether or not they pay back their loans or not. And most probably there will be some pattern. You know, if people tend to not pay their bills on time, you know, we can probably assume that they're most likely to also not pay their loan back on time, right? So there is some sort of pattern. We don't have to know exactly what that pattern is. The machine learning algorithm will discover that for us, but it needs to at least logically make sense that there might be a pattern. And this relationship or this pattern between the input and output of the data should not be completely random, right? Otherwise, there's no point in applying machine learning algorithms to it. So an example you can see on the slide is lottery winning numbers, right? It's impossible to predict lottery winning numbers because it's completely random, okay? So you can only apply machine learning to problems in which you have an input and output that have a relationship, okay? And... On top of that, you need to have enough data that you can actually discover this relationship. So you need to have quite a lot of data. And depending on some problems, you might need more and other problems might need less, but you need to have enough examples so that the machine learning model can actually train itself and fine tune itself to find that relationship. Now, one important thing to note is that if there is a very clear mathematical relationship between an input and output or like a very clean set of rules that can lead you from any input to the correct output in that case it doesn't make sense to use machine learning because then you can just write a program to follow those steps and there you go you have your model right because the whole point is we want to develop a model where we can have inputs mapped to the correct outputs right when we see a certain image, we want to be able to know that this image refers to a tiger or a bird. When we see a certain uh, image of a digit, we want to be able to know if that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9, right? If we see a particular set of data for an individual, we, need to, we want to know it, whether or not his loan is likely to succeed or not. If we see a certain email, we want to know whether or not that email is spam or not, right? So it's all input and output. Now, if there's a very clear relationship between the input and output to the point where you can just arrive at a, at a conclusion based on just the data itself without really training anything on it, then you can just use that relationship as long as it's accurate. A machine learning comes in handy when there must be some sort of relationship, but you can't really figure out what it is. And there's no clear cut, you know, mathematical or systematic way to figure that out. That's when you can use a machine learning algorithm. So some of the tasks that are best solved using machine learning instead of other more traditional methods are, is anything that involves recognizing patterns. So this can be, you know, facial identities or race, racial expressions, handwritten or spoken words. So, you know, basically computer vision, you know, recognizing stuff from visual input or from auditory input or text input, right? Understanding, arriving at conclusions based on text, you know, recognizing anomalies, so, you know, being able to recognize unusual sequences of credit card transactions. Now, this is a very good example because, you know, as a bank, for example, you keep track of all the activity of a particular bank account. So all the money that's being put in, pulled out, and all the credit cards associated with a certain bank account and how often they're used and that kind of stuff. And so this is a lot of input data. And based on this input data, and occasionally you have unusual credit card transactions that happen, uh, which is a clear output. And you assume that there must be some sort of relationship between this input data, all this data that's, that's existing around credit cards you know, in your system. And so there must be a relationship, but it's too difficult for you to like really figure out on your own. So that's where machine learning comes in. It builds a model in which you can input all of this input data you have, and it'll predict for you the unusual sequences, you know, of credit card transactions, for example, or unusual patterns of sensor readings in a nuclear power plant or unusual sound in your car engine, etc. So these are all examples of tasks best solved with machine learning. 
also prediction. So future stock prices or currency exchange rates, if you do believe that there might be some sort of relationship in it and it's not completely random, this can be solved using machine learning. Employee attrition, you know, the probability, you know, which of your employees is most likely to quit or to leave the job using input data such as, you know, how long they've been at the job, how much they're getting paid, when their last pay raise was, the type of job they're doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And loan defaulting, as we've discussed. So there are many examples. If you go into Google and you write examples of tasks best solved with machine learning, you'll see, you know, hundreds and hundreds of examples. I'm just writing here a few. Some more examples like spam filtering, fraud detection. So being able to detect fraud, being able to detect spam from amongst all your emails, recommendation systems like Netflix recommendation system, where they can recommend for you a movie you might like based on your past viewing history and that kind of stuff. Autonomous cars, as we all know, speech recognition, image classification, tagging, uh, we've discussed language translation, price prediction, advertising, playing games. So playing games nowadays has been pretty popular. Go has been beaten, Starcraft, chess quite some time ago. But see, chess was beat quite some time ago, but then it took a long time for Go to be beat as well. And that's, they really leveraged modern, you know, machine learning, deep learning, where there is a clear relationship between the input and output, but it's so difficult that you can utilize the power of machine learning. So I'm going to end part one of the introduction here. Part two, I'm going to be going into more of the different approaches and that kind of stuff in machine learning. Some of the, you know, more theory here. This was just meant more as an introduction. So I'll see you in the next part of the video. Bye-bye.